you know that I feel like that's the biggest thing like um when you go through a situation like that you might start asking yourself questions am I really good enough for this you need the television app 24 7 mini documentaries podcasts live shows dj live streams top five subscription packages plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports download it from the app store for free today beatbox created and we need to talk about world music and street culture killer killer podcast Yes, people, Killer Keller podcast live and direct central London or central as you need to be. It's your morning, it's time to get up and at them. We've got a very special guest inside the place. Firstly, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight, everybody checking out the Kellervision app, free download, Android and iPhone, street culture and more 24-7. Uh, Tiggs, the author, MC, Lyricist, how are you, Jen? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, man. Just got back from an amazing jog. So I'm all good. We were kind of just talking about this just as we jumped in. And uh, yeah, there is a different kind of uh, beast is running, isn't it? When you're used to the gym and used to it being a certain yeah, rhythm and pattern in your week, it's a whole different thing, isn't it? Most definitely, most definitely. But it takes some time to get used to, but once you're in the sort of like role, then it just becomes second nature. It's just like the same as going to the gym at the beginning. I mean, it's not that, it sounds easy now once you've been going there for a while. But if you try and remember the early times, then you'll see it's the same process, really. Yeah, yeah. And and like we kind of con- concurred, it it's almost, it's essential to keep up the um, pattern of going for a run, even if the gym's open, because you've got new resistance and you, things that you thought you had, you, you didn't when you were going to the gym. Yeah, exactly. And you see, like, you see when you're jogging in um, on a treadmill in the gym, yeah, there's <laughs> yeah, it has its pros and cons. Like, you don't have to worry about a dog running in your way or someone else jogging this way mm-hmm. or any other distractions. Because, like, let's say if I'm jogging um, to the park, I have to run like on the road first, which means I have to stop at traffic lights and this and that. So, yep. it's, load of obstacles where I feel like the gym I can just like the time is sort of there I set myself a time and it's yeah. like bang let's go get it out of the way yeah it's almost like um what do you think that's a good thing I think that's I, I think for running that's um perhaps that's a that's that's the golden you know you, the unexpected yeah but do I think it's a good thing to say it's over time mm. most definitely I feel like you need some sort of like goal. If there's no goal, you just feel like you can stop at any time. But if you set yourself a target, I mean realistic targets at the beginning, yeah. I feel like it becomes a lot easier and you just get fit as time goes on because you're just like your main aim is to just reach your target and keep setting yourself new ones. Funny you say that, Tiggs. You got me thinking down a down a, 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 a rabbit hole of different scenarios. Yes. For those you don't know, Tiggs the author is is MC lyricist, singer, vocalist. You know, t- we'll get into some more details in that a little bit later. But do you think, Tiggs, do you think setting goals as a creative artist, particularly in the city, do you think having those kind of structures in your day? that helps you creatively? Um, I think creative is it's a little bit different. Mm. Um, I don't really set myself goals because, because I feel like um, being a creative, you just sort of work off um, inspiration. So that happens whenever it happens. You can't really plan. Um, you can't really say to yourself, okay, this week I want to be inspired five times or ten times. Yeah. It it just happens when it happens and it's spontaneous. That's why I feel like, I mean, creatives just, they don't really have a structure in terms of working hours or, you know, sometimes 
everything can be a, a little bit all over the place mm. because that's pretty much what's going on in your brain. Um, yeah. So I never really set myself goals in terms of like um, this week I want to write five songs or I want to record 10 songs. I just like go with the flow and whatever happens out of that happens. It's a, it's, it's a tough one for poor old artists. Very much, I mean, you know, I come from that pedigree too. And the amount of times where, you know, you're trying to squeeze a, a circle through a square hole with a time frame that you have and the creative, you know, bang isn't there or or it comes at the most random of times. I, I think it's quite hard for people to compute that um, as, as a lifestyle. It kind of molds into yeah. your life. It's not just a job. It's like it falls into every every aspect of your life, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly, man. That's pretty much, it's your life. It's not the same as like, I remember um, like years ago, one of my first jobs was me working at a call centre. Mm -hmm. And that was a very target-driven sort of industry where you get to work, the first thing you're told is your targets. Your targets for the day. You need to make sure you're calling this many people. Mm. You you need to make sure you're getting this many people to sign up to whatever you're selling. Yeah. Um, so that one is like strictly based off target. You don't really have to um, be creative. You don't really have to be inspired by anything. Mm. Um, so with jobs like that, then that's understandable. Yeah. Um, but when you're like in the music industry, I mean, it, it, it depends. I think there's different sort of artists, to be honest. There's yeah. some, I'm sure some artists are very target driven. Like, you know. Yeah. I can imagine 50, I reckon 50 Cent is he's extremely targeted, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you can you can probably see and be like, okay, this person is very target-driven. Mm. Um, I, I think a lot of producers are target-driven as well. Yeah. But it just, it just depends um, what kind of artist you are. Dude, really? you just said that producers are target driven, bro. You're so on the money. They're like yeah. the most target driven out of anybody in the in the game. I think. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they are. They're, they're numbers. They're, they're maths. Exactly. They're on it, man. <laughs> so someone has to be anyway. Yeah. That's that's it's all the people behind the scenes are the ones who are target driven. The, yeah. The, the creatives will do the work. And then you will have the managers, the record labels, who are like, everything is to do with numbers. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of producers that be listening to this, like, totally relating to this. It's the yeah. batting average. It's the law of averages, isn't it? The more you make, the heavier, the, the harder the amount you hit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And sometimes, I mean, that can have an effect on the artist because when the record labels are so target-driven and they're most of the time they're communicating um, to the managers and not really directly to the artists. Yeah. Um, and the managers will pass on whatever message is coming down. Mm. And sometimes the pressure of um, the targets that the labels have set um, could affect on how the, art, the artist is like creating music. Mm. Um, oh yeah true if, if, if you're told oh you know what the last single didn't do well we need this one to do well so yeah. um, we need a top 20 single we're gonna um, get this feature on there or we want you to get in studio and work with this massive producer um, mm. now suddenly you feel like maybe I need to make this type of song in order for me to achieve that target 
There certainly isn't. There certainly is an upfront industry that still work in that in that um, day to day business model, right? Mm-hmm. Do you, would you would you say though? I mean, you know, Tig, you're you're very much upfront in the field right now. You know, you come from a pedigree. You come from a pedigree that, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's up there. But you were also in the front line, so you 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 can see behind you as well as in front. Do you think that? Do you think that industry still is priority today you know the kind of three single job on a major label or you're out kind of conversations um i feel like of course that still happens i mean that's yeah. always gonna happen yeah. it's like it's the music business at the end of the day it's that and business it, isn't it it's that yeah, yeah. That everything is based on results so yeah. if the results are not coming in then it's on to the next like Mm. <laughs> that's how it goes as ruthless as it is um, the only difference now I feel like um, if you get released by a record label because it never worked out it's not really the end of your career that's the other um, thing yeah there's a lot more paths now um, you can be even more successful independent whereas maybe like 10-20 years ago you couldn't really be that successful independent. Mm. So now it's not the end or if it doesn't work out when you're working with a major label. There's like, you can work with indie labels, you can work with distribution, you can put your own team together and just like do it yourselves. And there's so many routes. Yeah, it's true. I was speaking to DJ Ironic um, Mm -hmm. and... He was saying, you know, he expressed at the time that um, that the industry, there was this kind of milk milk it to it, you know, till it's empty and then throw the artist out. And particularly with genres, early grime and and the, you know, the, the, the celebrities of that particular point in time. Yeah. But he, he was saying, you know, it, it was quite a drop and... Speaking personally, speaking from other podcasts as well, it's um, that that drop to find yourself in that situation takes quite a lot of strength to swim back to shore and reinvent and create something new. You just got to be in it to win it when you when you go from something so high to the indie to that indie circuit, right? Yeah, I mean, more than anything, I feel like um, it can sort of make you doubt yourself as as a musician. For sure. You know, that I feel like that's the biggest thing. Like, um, when you go through a situation like that, you might start asking yourself questions. Am I really good enough for this? Am I uh, up for it? Yeah. Am I up for it? Um, why wasn't I successful? Like, mm-hmm. any other artists, any other big artists on the, on the major label, you know? I wonder how people, how, how would you deal with that? Speaking personally. I've been in that situation. How where, did you manage that? How did you manage that? Um, because for me, it was, it's just like, it's never... Like, for, for me, okay, the, the first thing is I'm not really making music because um, I want fame or anything like that. Mm. So in the ideal world for me is to just release music and disappear, release music and disappear, release music and disappear. Mm. And and I feel like um, nothing changed from when um, I wasn't with Sony anymore. My aim was still to make music because I still want the same message um, to be put out there. Mm. If I tell myself that all I'm doing is um, putting out message through my music. Um, I'm doing a lot of social commentary. Um, I'm writing a lot of stuff with political undertones. Mm. I, I feel like um, it's my responsibility to keep me putting um, music out. And I feel like um, just as long as I still have so much love and passion for actually making music. 
um, I'm going to continue to do that. So um, with me, it never really affected me at all. I was just like, okay, um, things never worked out um, there for whatever reason. Mm. Um, I had really nothing bad to say about anyone at um, Sony or at at RCA because I thought like I worked with some incredible people there Mm. and they were behind me. Um, And that's it. It's like music sometimes... I, I see it as it worked out because that established me as an artist. That's right. Uh, it introduced me to a whole new um, world. Um, and I feel like they took me from here to there. Mm-hmm. So if you ask me, of course, I'll tell you, it was an amazing experience. I met some great people who I even speak to, like some of them now. Mm. Um but that's how it goes in business sometimes. You just have to, um, sometimes it's timing. Sometimes maybe you share different um, visions. Mm. So they might want you to take this path and you want to take another path. So you just have to figure it out and look, look, look for other like-minded people who sort of share the same views and, share the same vision and then you and then you you go again so that's why i feel like it didn't really affect me uh, going through a situation like that and so eloquently put as well i think it's very easy to fall down the road of cynicism and thinking oh the world's against me but you you kind of and it, and also it's very stereotypical to us like yeah but it's business you you kind of got to have that head on of like this is this is like chess and yeah. the competition we're all competition we've all got different moves and you may not play to win this time but you'll definitely see the same person again later down the road <laughs> just, yeah. you got to exactly. work with the combinations yeah you have to tell yourself at the beginning, this is business. Whatever happens here, it's nothing personal. For real. Once you understand that, then you'd be like, it, it is what it is. It's not like anyone's being unfair. If yes. someone, let's say if today um, I invested in someone, let's say half a million, yeah, yeah. and maybe in two years' time, I make back 100 grand, and if I stop working with them in two years' time, would you not understand? Mm. You have to understand because I haven't made my money back. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. For what for whatever reasons, even if you feel like maybe I don't know, you, you can have whatever reasons you want, but one way or another, it just didn't work out business wise. So you just have to be on to the next. Damage collateral. Yeah, exactly. So that's mad, bro. Uh, mm-hmm. and just you know, let's get into this year, okay? So, what how did it all begin for you? Because you know, we're, we're, we're now talking in some current affairs, but yeah, the truth be, I mean, yeah, I think we got a mutual friend in Sway as well. That's that's my dog, yes, um, my guy, man. That's my you know what. Me and him used to buck. I, I used to beatbox with him in New York, bro. We used to go. When Serious? We, yeah, bro. I went to an install with him in New York. Idris Elba was there. Me and him beatbox. Sway dropping that, you know, double time. Woo. Yeah. Guy. So you come from a serious pedigree right there, man. So tell the people all about the A to Z from beginning, South London onwards. Yeah. In fact, earlier than that, Tanzania onwards. How? Let's explore this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was born in Tanzania um, and I grew up there until I was about eight years old. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to South London. Um, there I sort of like um, found it hard at the beginning. But I got to terms with it pretty quickly because I 
I mean, it was a whole culture switch. Um, just everything. The weather was different. Where else uh, in South London was this at the time? This is New Cross. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. area. Yeah. So after that, um, I was just going through a lot of stuff in my teenage years, just like normal teenager stuff. You know, you're getting in trouble all the time. Um, you're hanging around all your friends. You guys are up to no good. Yeah. Um, and my best friend was a DJ. He used to um, DJ grime music, um, rap, reggae, everything. So I, I just used to... Like whenever he used to DJ in like record shops, and this time he was like sixteen. What's his DJ name? Uh, DJ Fingers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the most talented DJs I've come across up to this day. Yeah. Um. So I used to just go with him everywhere, pirate radio. Um, so what year was this? What what year was this? This was like. Like, maybe like 10 years ago okay so we're talking mid noughties ish yeah okay mm -hmm. so sorry just, as you were he had the big well he had a big sound system or something what was going on yeah, he did he did he had a, he had a crazy setup in his in his i mean like in the spare bedroom yeah. um where he used to have his uh Dex set up there and he used to just like he's he's the guy when it comes to mixing he's he knows literally all the tricks under the book thank god for uh, live streams bro because like with those djs they're doing it now in real time and a lot of in a lot of respects it's more fun yeah. watching it than even doing it in the clubs because they're just getting loose yeah 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 now everything's pre-recorded yeah you know what i mean but he he's like a a proper sound man yeah so um, I learned a lot from him because nice. um, he used to have like a computer in there, like music equipment. Um, and I used to be at his house all the time. Like I was living with him at one point and every time he left the house to go somewhere, um, I'll just be like, I'll be in a little spare room on the computer, just like, figuring out how to use the programs like Cubase and Free Loops Free. Born uh, into the game. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how it actually started. Wow. And it, and it became like a little obsession. It was, it was like the same way how someone would go into a room and like play FIFA all the time. Yeah. It, that's how it became for me it was like I'm discovering new stuff I'm learning um, how everything is done the mm. more I find out the more I, I want to know the more I'm sort of invested into it mm. um, and I just became fascinated with like the whole process of how music was made because at that mm. point I knew that I loved music I loved songs um, but sort of unraveling how music is made it was mind-blowing to me. Mm. And I was like, so this is how you do this. And this is how you do this. Like, how, like I, was, I was just like so confused, but so intrigued at the same time. So at that point... I was like on YouTube all the time, um, trying to look at documentaries on like music documentaries on different musicians, how they worked. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was just sort of mind blown. And I started making beats early on. When I was making beats, I was recording like, um, some ideas like chorus ideas on the beats and whatnot mm. and recording my own music here and there and um 
what what happened next after after that whole space of me getting into music mm. um that's when a year later i started working um at the call center right so i was working at the call center and i remember one of my other friends he had a studio and i used to go there like before work and like after work so one time he he just messaged me saying um sway is coming down to the studio today casual he, yeah <laughs> casual and of course me growing up I, like i used to think sway was a, an incredible like musician yes. an incredible rapper from like seeing him i remember seeing him first on like on channel u yeah uh, right. and these songs used to play all the time i think it was flow fashion that's when i first um heard of it and i was like nah this guy's different to everyone else yeah it was like him well, and i guess uh kalashnikov they were the main contenders that were kind of pulling in that yeah. uk hip-hop thing into the channel u weren't they yeah i thought because i i thought kalashnikov was very sick but i've seen a lot of kalashnikov type of rap before yeah with sway i've never really seen a uk guy go at it um go go have that sort of lyrical ability yeah um not take himself too serious but he can do the serious stuff mm. with like just the crazy flows punch lines and I used to think man this guy is too good too cold but so when that opportunity came up um I couldn't even make it to the studio that day <laughs> but I think my friend played some ideas and so it was like uh you should tell him to come down to the next session So the next session came about I went there met him and everything and he was like um I've got this idea of like um doing like my own version of the still dre song right and I was like okay cool and he was like if you got any ideas I'll play you the beat right now so he played me the beat and I just recorded the chorus there and then wow and he was like yeah i messed with this and i remember maybe a week later he called me saying we're shooting a video in like two weeks and oh by the way i've put kane on the song as well <laughs> so i was like what is going on Oh, got upgraded uh, pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, "Oh my days, mm. it's crazy!" Wow, you know That's what I mean? Sick. Yeah. So, and he was like, "Do you have like any of your own songs?" I was like, "Yeah, I've got some ideas, but um, I don't know really." Like, he was like, "Let's have a session. We'll listen to your stuff." Mm. So I played him some of the music that I was like just working on, and he was like, "We're gonna take these four songs, and we're gonna put out an EP." And that's wow. how I'm working with Sway and Decipher. So we put that out under Decipher, wow. and that's what really opened doors for everything else. Yeah, that was and, that was a real era-defining moment back then yeah yeah most definitely you kind of had to get in your seat yeah it was like surreal like being at a video shoot being like i used to watch sway and watch kano yes. like these are the guys yeah yeah and, and i'm here on the song right next to them and that, how did that, it feel how did it feel that was amazing man to be honest at that point i didn't even really make my mind up that do i really want to be an artist or not But when that happened, I was like, uh, duh. I gotta <laughs> be doing be, something right here. <laughs> yeah, gotta be. Yeah. 
Because I was like, I guess I'm a musician now, especially I'm putting out an EP. Yeah, for sure. How yeah. many? Have, hold on. So, influential wise, because Kano, Kano was seminal back then. Like, and and yeah, yeah like you say, Sway was up there with the the Dizzy Rascals and the Ironics, and you know, um, the Wileys. Th- those characters were they were they top tier like influences for you? Um, to be honest. Um... Was it grime or was it more, you know, hip hop? What was the what was the things that you were influenced by at the time that you know that that kind of triggered you to be like, well, actually, you know what? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I really, I think I've got enough. I, I have enough uh, knowledge in the bag and inspirations and whatnot to pull this EP off. Like, what were the what were the influences of the time? Um, I, I think just my, my main influence was Dizzy Rascal. Mm. Um, he was the person who I looked like, every time I heard him, I was just like, he's just so different from the rest. Mm. And that just became a thing of me, uh, where I like people who stand out from the bunch. Because mm. I feel like they're just being themselves. And me hearing um, Dizzy Rascal, like spitting bars on, on pirate radio. Mm. His, his voice is so distinctive. Crazy. And he's just attacking, attacking, attacking relentless. <clears throat> um, yeah. So I thought he was amazing. And then when I heard like Boy in a Corner, when Boy in a Corner came out. <laughs> Change game. Yeah, because before that, I didn't even know what Dizzy Rascal looked like until I saw um, the fix up look sharp video on yeah. on TV, mm. and I was like, "Whoa, this is what Dizzy Rascal, this is Dizzy Rascal," mm. you know. And then you're hearing the, the choice of beats because the fix up look sharp beat is not even grime. It's like it's like an old school hip hop beat. Yeah, yeah. Old you know what I mean? Clever. So, and and hearing like the beat selection well I mean he was making most of it himself um but the the beats on Boy in the Corner oh my god mad add add that to like his sort of approach then it's crazy it's crazy I think I loved every song on that album I could still listen you know there's they, these are era defining things like Mm. The Streets, Dizzy Rascal. Yeah. I could listen to both of them albums back to back and probably yeah. listen to it again. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, for me, that was my biggest inspiration. I was just like, man, I need, when when people hear me, I hope I sound as original as Dizzy Rascal when I heard him. Do you do? And you know what's crazy about. Um, you fell in right at the right time. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, where unique uniqueness was celebrated. Now, I'm not saying that, that it's not celebrated now, but there's a lot more falling in line based on the circumstances of the industry. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's people not wanting to diversify. It's just the, 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 the margins are a lot more smaller and the turnaround has to be a lot quicker, you know? Yeah. Some people don't. Some people don't want to be different. Some people just want to be like, I want to be like this guy, so I'm just going to copy everything that he's doing. <laughs> yeah, there's like, that too. Some, the, the, That's putting that, it nicely. I'm not going to lie. There, there's definitely artists like that. Yeah. We're just like, you know what? I'm going to be like this guy. Everything. <laughs> everything he does, I'm going to be doing the exact same thing. Yeah. I think that's the only... It's a big difference from now and like that that era I would say mm. I'd say all the sort of MCs that I grew up listening to like um, Wiley D-Double um, yeah. Dizzy Rascal Kano yeah. um, they all were very distinctive yeah they all had they were all like 
different cartoon characters. You know, you have different mm-hmm. cartoon characters that they're all action heroes and they have their own powers. Like, yeah. This one's like got a really good flow. This one's got really good, like just presence. Does, do you get what I mean? I do. I mean, the only, I mean, Giggs is a good example of a, of a I mean, but then he sells. That's why yeah. he does so well because no one else is, they can't fuck with him. But yeah, I mean, that's why those are the guys that will rise to the top, the ones who are themselves. You're still going to, I mean, you're always going to get like guys who are themselves. There's still yeah. plenty of people who are like themselves now. Maybe some of them just ain't got the, the light yet. But the ones who are in the limelight, a lot of them, yeah, do try to copy each other. So, which is some real lame and simple frontal cortex shit. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing yeah. at all trying to like. It's almost like they they're going for the easy escape, and it's like, nah, do be patient. Like, have your own shit down. If it, it means, yeah. you know what I mean, it's like be different. Yeah, but it it all comes down to. What's your reason for coming for making music? What's mm. your reason to get into the music industry in the first place? True. Because I can tell you that their reason back then was not the same reasons now. You know, True. Mm-hmm. Um, people are, were making music then when you couldn't even make a living from music. So yeah. you're literally just doing it because of the passion and the bragging rights of being the best um, lyricist in your area or the best lyricist in in London. And you'll be ready to clash anyone to prove that you can't ever be tested as a mic man. But now people won't even want to clash you. They don't even want to battle you. They're like, like, why would I do that? You know what I mean? I'm I'm not trying to be the best in this. Yeah, I just, yeah, I, yeah, just yeah. I just came to make some money. <laughs> and I'm out, I dip out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even love music like that, which Dark is form. fair enough. You know what I mean? If you're if you're coming in here, I'm not gonna knock anyone um with the mentality of making money. You know what I mean? Because hmm. it, it it happens. People have different circumstances in life. I can't I, I can't be uh, upset about a guy who wants to make some money. And and move his family out of the hood. Facts. You know what I mean? Yeah. That he he has a different purpose. That that's 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 what he's trying to achieve. So And anybody that tries to uh contest that, yeah. Try walking in the shoes, you have no fucking Yeah, ideas. you haven't been in, in those shoes. Yeah. So I totally understand. I totally understand that. But you come from a pedigree again, in, you know, just relating back to where you are currently in your world. Mm-hmm. You hold, uh, and this is something that maybe should resonate with people, particularly who are listening and uh, you know trying to weigh out the pros and cons of what this, you know, of what what, what, what side of the lane they're on. There is yeah. a cult, there is a cultural currency, which yeah. takes time to, you know what I mean. It takes time to build, and you have a cultural currency, which. You know, that, that matures like a fine wine over a period of time, he says in his best rhymes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, to be honest, I just don't... Like, my, my aim is to just carry on making great music, inspire some people, um, mm. spread my message more. Um, and, yeah, if I can impact people's lives and then job well done you know I want to have um, I want to make bodies of work that they can listen back to in 50 years mm-hmm. in 100 years and it can still move them you know Blame It On The You is the new release that's uh, that's imminent it'll be yes. out when we, we were out here and Swinging our hands from the rafters, we are here. Well, tell me about this release. Tell me about what the process is. Um, man, blame me on the eats. I've been writing this album for a while. Um, not necessarily all the songs, mm. but beginning the whole process. I began the process in 2016, I believe. 
Um, and of course, throughout the years, I wasn't actively working on the actual album because those other projects that I was doing. Yeah. But I knew what type of album that I wanted to make. Mm. Um, I knew how I wanted it to sound. I knew what topics I want to touch on. And I was able to start the writing process then. So, of course, in 2016, I probably wrote like one song and I was like, okay, when the time is right, that's when I'm going to finish it off and release this album. And me, by saying when the time is right, is once I have been inspired enough, once I have met the right producers who I feel like can take what's in my head and bring it out, Mm -hmm. then it'll be go time for the album. No rushing this shit. You can't just, there ain't just immediate pool of producers that you just grab, 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 like, because you'll just be firing blanks the whole time. You have to, this shit takes time, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. I don't want to rush it. I mean, I could still release music. Um, I could still release projects, work with other people. Right. But for my own, especially debut album, man, I want it to be a masterpiece. Damn right. <laughs> so... Sleep on this stuff I can't believe it You know The single Single mindedness Like you're on Some album Legacy shit Yeah Exactly Exactly man I wanna put out The album I wanna Have it on vinyl You know what I mean So When you're playing yes. that When you're relaxed You can listen to it Top to bottom Without skipping anything Headphone crew Yeah And just be like Yeah This is just like even if you don't like the topics, you can appreciate the music. Do you make the music for? I mean, look, there's there's objectives in every release, isn't it? Your your influences on the album are all instrumentally from your upbringing, Tanzania, um, and just influences that have inspired you. But when you're when you're looking at the the future. You've gone back. You've got all of this influence. Does do you do you put it in the context of the now, or do you put it in the context of live? Do you put it in context of, like you say, when people are listening to it on vinyl or are in the car, or you know, d- did you want to make those influences mold to um, people's dailies and what they do? And you know, did you want to did you want to harness a particular area in people's in people's lives? Um, not necessarily. Like, um, I feel like a lot of people go through the same stuff on a day-to-day basis anyway. Mm. So I feel like um, one way or another, um, you might not be able to relate to everything that I'm saying on the album, but you will probably understand what I'm talking about and you might relate to some of the things. Um, you can listen to it in your own way, any way you want. You can listen to it in your car, in your house, um, on the way to work. I mean, it's it's not an album for the clubs. It's right. more something you want to listen to and feel. Gotcha. So, the reason why I ask that is because, because of the influences of such instruments and such, um, you know, direct directions in your you know, past and present, I was thinking to myself before we started, I was thinking, damn, like, because, you know, you're a live performer too. Like, how's that going to translate in the, in the live, in a live arena? And then I thought about obviously what the world is going through. And then I thought, well, maybe when you started in 2016, there wasn't that same precedence of like knowing where it was going to go, considering where it is going to go is completely different to where you were in 2016. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's true like you know what when I I sort of started it 
and I was asking myself, um, are these songs that I'm writing now gonna last the test of time? Because sometimes you might make music and in two years time, you, you listen to that song and you're like, oh my God, this sounds so dated. Yeah. But with the approach that I took writing this album, um, is what I've pretty much been learning um, the whole time. Like, just write a good song. Mm. Just write a good song. And the rest will take care of itself. Yeah. Just, just focus on writing a good song. The same, the same way how I might listen to a song um, from like I don't know from the seventies or the eighties now. Mm-hmm. Of course, sonically, I might be like that. It sounds dated. Um, mm. because maybe the the type of drums that they're using or the type of mix that they have for sure but the song is still a good song and if they were to play it somewhere people are gonna the energy that they'll feel all the energy from that song yeah true and that's what I want man because I know this this album is a man it's a live experience so when people have the chance to see this album live, that'd be crazy. I'm gonna make sure the show is incredible. Mm-hmm. So hopefully they stop um, by the end of the year. Um, things can go back to normal in terms of shows. I think maybe there's a uh, precedence in artists' head in minds now, you know, with the overflow of people wanting to do gigs and the limits of, you know, promoters, clubs, venues, they're being scaled back because of the situation. Yeah, I think it's yeah. forcing artists to be a little bit more thoughtful about how they present their live show and, and what they're doing with their songs and, and yeah. how that translates, huh? Most definitely. Most definitely. I mean, I mean, most artists they want to be on stage, they want to be there performing. Yeah. Um. So the quicker we can get back on stage, the better. Better. <laughs> yeah. Better. The better for everyone. People get. People will get their social lives back, and we get to stay sane and. Yeah. Um. See people's feedback firsthand. Yeah, but it, what this conversation is suggesting is it's now's the time to be creative with your live show to make your USP to any promoter with a budget or what budget they have, make you, a, a, you know, a bargain because it, and the same with the, the music, you know, be unique and take your time. And then when you have these opportunities, you're, you're built with such individuality and USP. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Most definitely. It's the way it goes down, bro. Hey, listen, it's a pleasure talking to you, my mate. Thank you, my man. Hope it was good for you as it was for me. And uh, I know the people out there totally appreciate it. So, uh, blame it on you. March 12th. That's the one, yes. right? Yes. March 12th. Come on. Yes, sir. No games, no games. Any features? Tell us about who's on it. Anybody and producer wise, anything to add? Um, producers, I've worked with some amazing producers on there. Um, my two main guys, um, John Cornby, who's a super, 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 super duper, duper, duper producer. Um, right. And my other guy, Sean Prue, is another super, super. Hold producer. on, Sean Prue's my dog. Yeah, that's my guy. Hold tight, Sean Proof. Yeah, that's my guy. Man. I've been Dangerous. working with him. Yes, actually, Sway is the one who introduced me and Sean Proof. He was like, Tiggs, there's this guy called Sean Proof. You have to work with him. 
you guys need to get a studio together. And that was like, then, so we've been working ever since and we've made so many like records together, so many bangers. You can hear the hip hop in his beats. He's like the artisan of, of one of a kind producer. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So it was great. Um, done some stuff with him. Um, I worked with Laconic, other super producers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it, to be honest. That's fantastic. So this is going to be a big one. Yeah. People get involved. Get involved and follow our kid. You know what I mean? Thank you so much for joining us, mate. I really appreciate it. That's all right, man. Thank you for having me. And I'll be back soon. March <laughs> <12. laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, hold tight. Don't forget, Cop It takes the author. New album, Blame It on a Ute, on its way. All right. Thank you so much, brother. All right. You stay lucky. Killer Killer Podcast. We are like him was out of fashion. Don't talk to any strange ones. Stay lucky. Peace. Peace. 